Good evening and welcome to Old First Concerts. And tonight we have a very special concert with Ensemble for These Times. The concert will begin at 8 p.m. And uh, before the concert, as we often do with Ensemble for These Times concerts, we will have a brief interview with two of the composers on tonight's program, Mary Bianco and Dalit Warsha. And uh, if you read along in the program notes, you'll see these are some very accomplished composers. And uh, tonight we will hear uh, some of their new works and uh, some other works as well. So um, we're going to start by uh, getting to know them a little bit better. And uh, we'll start with Mary Bianco. So uh, Mary Bianco, can you uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and about the works that we're going to hear tonight? I'm very happy to. And I want to make sure that I have unmuted myself, yes? OK, good. So let's talk a bit about the first composition you will hear. The title of it is, Are You Born? David Garner, with whom I have studied composition since August of, 19, uh, no, not 19, 2015. OK, five years, uh, put me up to this idea and connected Nanette and Ensemble for these times. David was getting very tired of my writing for string instruments and shamed me into attempting a vocal excursion. Other than a few bad songs I wrote many years ago, I am for the most part a chamber music composer. So yes, this was a challenge. First, to seek out a text since my own poetry did not fit the title for tonight's concert, Old Versus New. And as I looked around, I found a poem by Muriel Rukeyser and the phrase in it sang to me, really resonated. So you will hear that repeated a number of times. And yes, by the way, I did know Muriel. She died in 1980, so I knew her quite a, a few years ago. Fortunately, Nanette has been able to work with certain words from her poem that were not easy to set to music. Now, let's have a few words about the etude that I've written for Margaret Helbig. Chopin was the master of etudes. Many were written actually when he was just a teenager, uh, 1829 to 1833. And Chopin was the favorite assignment of my piano teacher when I was all of six years old. A bit early to understand Chopin, but far more desirable than the journey assignments that I was being given. So, Chopin designed these etudes or studies to challenge students to strengthen their left hand. And these etudes became very popular and were soon raised to concert status, not just for his students. So here the left hand grabs the melody right away from the start and continues leading from start to finish. As for the choice of key, Chopin used every key of the rainbow. I have chosen A major, and I pretty much stay in A major throughout the etude. A final note regarding my manner of composing. I do not compose at the piano, and am sadly unable to play the music that I write for the piano. I guess I should have practiced more. So I leave this in Margaret's very capable hands to have you hear the etude that I have entitled Etude for Margaret. Great, thank you so much, Mary. It's fascinating. Uh, let's go over to Dalit Orsha in, uh, in New York. She's coming to us from New York, so it's a little later there. And uh, welcome, Dalit. 
Thank you so much. It's great to be a part of this evening and it was long awaited. I remember uh, plans had begun for last spring and so that this feels really uh, like, like a, the final you know, cadence. <laughs> In any case, um, I'm a, a composer, a pianist. I've been known to be a thereminist as well. Uh, I, I'm a professor and um, the piece that will be uh, performed this evening by myself uh, is entitled uh, Winter Dream in Memoriam Charlotte Salomon. Um, now, it, it, the piece encapsulates a lot of, uh, in quite a few of my priorities that I address in many of my works. Um, for one thing, throughout the course of my compositional uh, experience, which has been for most of my life, I, I've tended to uh, gravitate toward stories of women in history, usually artists whose voices were, they were cut short in some way, or um, they weren't heard um, as, as much as they should have been in their lifetimes. And in the case of Charlotte Salomon, um, she was a highly gifted German Jewish uh, painter who lived uh, she was born in 1917, and she lived in Berlin, uh, was in her early 20s as the, um, the Nazis came to power, and she found herself in hiding with her uh, grandparents in South France for three years. Um, while she was in hiding, uh, she learned some, some very dramatic and tragic uh, details about her family life that apparently her mother had committed suicide, her aunt had committed suicide. And then as they were all together at that time, uh, her grandmother committed suicide as well. And uh, when that happened, uh, Charlotte, um, uh, she felt that she either also was going to go the same route or, and this is a quote, under, um, what was she going to do? She was going to undertake something wildly eccentric. And that is exactly what she did. What she ended up creating was an astounding body of 769 canvases that were her autobiography. She designated this autobiography as a zingspiel in three acts with a prologue and a cast of characters in which all the personalities in her life were given nicknames. And um, she proceeded to tell her life story through, through figurative painting. Um, and as she is painting through the course of this time, you notice how her style changes. It begins in a very detailed, very, very colorful, ornate way as she's, uh, remembering her childhood. And as time lapse, time continues, you see that the, the painting is, is becoming increasingly hurried. There are more colors of gray. It's more abstract. Um, and by the end uh, of, of this, this huge, um, impressive amount of work, you see the, the images have, have completely gone by the wayside. And all you see are words just kind of etched in, in, uh, in paint across the page. Um, and on top of these canvases were overlaid tracing paper on which she put quotes of poetry, of folk songs, of philosophy, of thoughts that she herself had. And, and, and this is where the composer in me, the interest was especially piqued, quotes of music. So Carmen's Habanera, for example, figures when um, her father marries her stepmother, who's an opera singer. Um, Schubert's Winterreise figures, Bach chorales, etc. So when I saw Winterreise, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I, I'm such a Schumann, a Schubert and Schumann, actually. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm aficionado. I mean, I, I had to address this piece. And um, quotation is something I adore doing also in my music quite a bit. And uh, so this was the perfect opportunity to take most prominently the song Gute Nacht, uh, which opens Winterreise, and to quote it in distortion. And that sort of uh, uh, is, is it's sort of um, uh, surround, it's the beginning and the end of the piece. 
in the middle section, it really is like a nightmare. Um, and in this nightmare, you have a collage of many of the other Schubert uh, songs from the collection. What happened to Charlotte at the end is that she was captured by the Nazis and at age 26, she was killed in Auschwitz, five months pregnant. And uh, her work was found years later. So. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a, quite a story, um, it, pretty amazing. Um, thank you so much. And uh, that must have been quite an adventure to compose on that. <laughs> um, I will say it was it's a bit surreal uh, resurrecting it now because when I composed it, it was during the election four years ago. And so when I was writing the the nightmarish section, I, I really was feeling this sense of <laughs> of imminent of, of terror. <laughs> and I, I understood. I feel like this piece is relevant now for some reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, Let's, Mary, I would love to hear a little bit about um, when you found your compositional voice, uh, because I noticed that, um, you know, it seems like your work has become incredibly popular just over the, over the last three or four years. You've been incredibly uh, productive with, with many uh, commissions and many works. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, when you found your compositional voice and what, uh, how that has affected you through, throughout your career? Actually, he let me know he was going to ask this question. So <laughs> I had a few moments to think about how I want to respond. Um, well, Matt, I was writing music when I was about four, five, six years old, uh, because that was much more fun than practicing the scales and the churny. Uh, for those of you who don't know who churny is, Delete will tell you that it's something that she has to give all her piano students and they hate it as much as I did. <laughs> I teach composition. <laughs> I teach composition and they don't experience churny. But he was also oh, very- Oh, good, <laughs> wonderful. All right, so there I am with my legs dangling off the piano bench because I can't reach the pedals and I'm writing songs and having a wonderful time. And uh, my mother walks in the room and says, is that what you're supposed to be practicing? And I said, oh yeah, sure, right, yeah. Well, it wasn't. So <laughs> when I was about, uh, oh, maybe 15, I rebelled about, oh, I said, that's, that's the last piano lesson I'm going to take. And I decided I would be a composer at that point and actually did study composition uh, and went to Sarah Lawrence College where I studied a lot of composition. And uh, then, oh, I don't know, I decided I didn't want to be a starving musician. So I became a stockbroker. And about 2012 or 13, I said, you know, I have to get back to music. This is, this is a very big part of me. So I enrolled at Mills College and got a master's degree, graduated in uh, 2015. And I have been writing music since I started at Mills and since 2015 on a daily basis. So that's why there's so much stuff around. Uh, I love to write music. I, if a day goes by where I don't write some music, uh, the day is just not right. That's a long answer to your question, Matt. Thank you so much. That that is uh, that's really fascinating, and it, it seems like um, you know I, I think these days it is it's not unusual for uh, people to start out uh, in the musical world, uh, take a little time in in another career, and then come back. I'm, I'm we had another um, performer. Uh, last year named Serene, who um, is a fantastic pianist. And um, she uh, got into programming and uh, it was very active and big into programming and hacking. And then uh, 
you know, said, oh, you know, that's, that was great, but I'm back to being a piano. So um, it, it's, that's really interesting. Uh, Delete, what about you? Did you, uh, have you composed since uh, childhood as well? Uh, I, I confess I have. Um, it's, uh, my goodness. I, I like to say that music is my native language alongside English, and I, I learned uh, how to read both simultaneously at age three, and uh, the, the way I, I, music just suffused my life is that my, pian my mother uh, was a piano teacher, and so uh, music was a constant. And um, the way I think most kids just naturally make up stories, I would make up stories, but at the piano. And to this day, I, I, I think I, I relate as much to writers as I do to composers, and often think of myself as a writer addressing music, which is a language as any other what syntax and vocabulary and paradox and and wonderful you know just just limitless ways of of dealing with a set set parameters um and, but music can express beyond what words can and uh when i set text for example and by the way mary we have to after this, have a conversation about Muriel Rokeyser because I'm I'm dying to hear more since you knew her. Uh, I set a poet poem of hers, um, and uh, but when when I address text, I, it's what the words cannot say, and exploring perhaps a phrase through maybe multiple times through different emotional angles and experience. Um, in many cases, though, back to your question, I started very early. I was writing piano music. When I was eight years old, I won a concerto competition, and the prize was to play with a local orchestra. The conductor had the gumption to ask me if I would um, orchestrate my piano music that had recently won um, a young composer's competition. And I said, yes, absolutely. Um, my mother had a, a figurative heart attack and, uh, you know, because here an eight-year-old was going to write an orchestral piece. And it just felt very, very natural to me. And I was very lucky in that um, before ever officially studying composition, most of my young years actually were sp spent learning on the job, really. I, I was offered the opportunity to work with performers and orchestras, which is how I figured out my sound and learned how it all works. So I always felt I had a very, um, I felt unrestricted, I think, in terms of style, in terms of what I wanted to say. And then later, um, I studied uh, at Columbia and at Juilliard, and that was a much different, of course, much different and more self-aware um, uh, relationship with composing. But it was always very, very natural. And of course, there were the ebbs and flows. I mean, you test yourself or your, your muses test you. You know, sometimes they appear and sometimes they, 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 uh, they leave for a while. And you have to, you have to rediscover that, that passion. Um, and I think it helps to have these, these other identities at the same time because they play off each other. So if I'm not writing, maybe, maybe I'm uh, teaching more or maybe I'm uh, performing on theremin more or then I'm a pianist. Or, so it all symbiotically reinforces each other. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left before the music starts. And I just wanted to let our audience know that if you have any questions for our composers, please type them in the chat and um, I'll make sure to uh, get as many of those in as we can. So uh, again, if you have any questions for our composers tonight, um, Mary, I, I know before when we were talking, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you might like to talk a little bit about how the ongoing pandemic has affected uh, your uh, your work. Uh, would you like to say anything about that? I, I would. Uh, yes, there have been some weeks where I could not write a note of music. I just, the sadness and the uh, news would, would just completely demolish my creative need. 
Now, I know that, you know, we know a lot of artists and musicians who create best when they are under the most stress. Well, I don't think I do that so well. I uh, really, I found it very difficult uh, to, to hear the music that is always in my head. Suddenly it just, it vanished. It wasn't there. Luckily it's back. But uh, for me, I don't, as I mentioned, I don't write at the piano. Uh, so unless I can hear the music in my head, it doesn't work for me. So yes, uh, the sooner this craziness is over, the better my music will be. Oh, not to mention the fact that it's very difficult to get a performance these days because most of the musicians are uh, just, they're desolate. They're, they're so, so uh, impoverished financially and musically. Yes, thank you. I know it's an incredibly stressful time for everyone. Um, uh, we, we just had our, uh, our 50th anniversary is this year at Old First Concert. So uh, we just had a virtual gala on Sunday uh, to help us uh, raise money. And, and if anyone would like to see that, um, the pianist from tonight, Ma uh, Margaret Halbig, was one of the participants in the program. And it is available on our YouTube channel to watch. You can watch the live stream. It has some great performances. And we were able to raise quite a bit of money to uh, help us continue on. So, um, so we're one of the few organizations that um, is continuing to present concerts uh, virtually. And um, I think we're doing a great job with it. <laughs> um, so Dalit, I, last year we, Hi, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I wanted to pitch in about this last question just because um, it, it is always very, uh, it's, uh, it's really illuminating for oneself to, see how one responds creatively in these very extreme situations. And um, I remember right after 9-11, um, at, at first, I, I was in New York, and at first I wrote a, a very um, a tragic uh, a cappella choral work. Um, but then in the course of the year, I started writing this as ecstatic celebratory music, and I had no idea where this came from. And I think it's it's resilience. It's uh, um, celebrating and acknowledging life. And the same thing happened now with me. Uh, so in the last six months, I've been working on, um, I mean, I, I'm just churning out these piano pieces that are, they're, they're filled with um, something ecstatic. And I think it's it's a it's a necessity. And and back to Charlotte Salomon, I think that's exactly what was occurring with her at that time, which suddenly prompted all this, you know, generation of. I'm going to add one one thought to that, and that is that uh, a wonderful violinist whose name is Siwoo Kim asked me to write some uh, music for him, solo violin, and his instructions were make it uplifting. So I think, yes, we are, we are all looking for how to face COVID in a positive manner. And also it's amazing how our art can change us, I think, the process of creating. So by your creating something uplifting, you're going to go through a process and the piece will reflect all these, like the, the tension of emotions as a result. It'll be fascinating. Yeah. The that's wonderful, uplifting. Um, yes, there can never be too much of that, um, when, especially when people are feeling down, right? <laughs> that it, it just lifts your soul. Yes, absolutely. We did get a, a question um, in from Cheryl Spencer. Uh, how do you work out how long a piece should be? Is it just, you know, how long should a piece be? Uh, why don't we start with Mary? I have a funny answer to that, and that is that I met an Argentinian composer who charges by the measure, by the bar, and I said, well, that, that sort of encourages you to write a long, long, long piece, doesn't it? Uh, 
I usually leave it up to the, the person I'm writing music for. And I say, not only how long would you like it to be, but is there a particular key you would like it to be in, major or minor mode? Tell me a little bit about your favorite composers and then off I go. Okay, Dalit. It, it depends on the scenario. I mean, when, it, when it's a commission, I, I, the more I know, the better, because I think constraints, in fact, are inspiring. Uh, when you know what you're dealing with, then you know how to work with it, against it, all of that. Um, uh, it depends. I, I think I'm trying to think in the case of this piece, um, if it was given me a timeline of 15 minutes or if I just felt it must be that, um, I think it's maybe a 12 minute piece. Um, it, it really depends. Great. And uh, Mary, you should have told the uh, Argentinian composer that he could just use one eight meter and get a lot of money. <laughs> That's what I would have done. Um, well, I, was, I was rather astounded by his uh, <laughs> way of charging. Uh, it, to me, that just seemed outrageous. Uh, but as <laughs> As Dalit says, when you have a commission, you probably get some guidelines from whomever you are writing for. And the more guidelines I have, the better. In fact, I have much easier time writing for a musician who I've heard perform live, by the way, not a Zoom. And uh, I've been able to watch this musician and listen very intently. So whenever I go to a concert, and let's hope there will be some soon, you will see me sitting in the first row so I can observe everything that's going on. Great. Thanks. Uh, Delete, another question came in. Uh, curious about your name. Where, what's the origin of your name, Delete? Oh, it's a Hebrew name. My mother is from Israel. And uh, eat in Hebrew is a diminutive suffix. So it's like a small dahlia. Oh. Great. Yes. Um, good. And then let's see. Uh, is there? Uh, this will be our last question because we have to get on to the music. But um, do you have a favorite combination of instruments or a favorite instrument to compose for? Uh, we can start again with Mary. Well, as I mentioned, for years I was composing for string instruments. Uh, unfortunately, I don't play any string instruments. In fact, the only instrument I do play, and only when no one is listening, is the piano. Uh, although I was a percussionist, uh, and that was a wonderful opportunity to listen to the orchestra that I was with, uh, and listen to each instrument, and really get to know the sound, the range, the uh, ability of each instrument. But, um, wow. Dalit, you take it from there. Well, I, I think I feel most natural with the orchestra, actually, um, and the piano, and the two inform each other. I think I relate very much to um, Debussy's and, and Ravel's uh, sort of symbiotic interchange between piano and orchestra. They, I mean, Debussy, in his case, with his preludes, he wrote those piano works after all of his orchestral pieces. And so you really get a sense that he is experiencing orchestra to the point that there are three staves <laughs> on each uh, uh, system for the piano. Um, and, and Ravel, you know, starting at the piano and, and uh, uh, developing it all, three-dimensionalizing it through orchestra. So whether I write for orchestra or not, I find myself sublimating it into, even in solo, to solo works or, chamber works. Now I know we were meant to be on the same program, Delhi, because I adore Debussy and the string quartet. Uh, to me, that's one of my most favorites and probably why I started to write so much for strings. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes. And uh, last, uh, last Friday, we had a circadian string quartet and they actually uh, transcribed several of Debussy's uh, preludes for string quartet. It was very, very nice program. Really? Um, yeah, very nice oh, program. I know which ones. That's fascinating. 
um, yeah, you can look at on our on our website, but uh, or I can send you the link. Okay, yeah. well that brings to a conclusion our composer talk. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, it was wonderful to talk with you uh, to this evening, and now we're going to move on to the music portion of our of our concert with Ensemble for These Times. Thank you.